All right, good morning and welcome to the TC Dojo from Single Sourcing Solutions. The TC Dojo is a TechCom community that is driven by you. Tell us what you want to learn. You choose the topics and we find the experts. In the TC Dojo session today, we are lucky to have Kit Brown Hoekstra as our visiting Dojo master. Kit is an SDC fellow, SDC Society immediate, well, most immediate past president, I forget we just had elections or so not quite immediate, but very recently. <laughs> She's the experienced consultant with 25 years of experience in technical communication, much of it working with localization teams. She's traveled a diverse and fascinating path, from working as a volunteer for Idaho Search and Mountain Search and Rescue to writing poetry and teaching the next generation of technical writers to working on content that is intended to last for extremely long periods of time. Like that, working for teams, working to restore and recover Superfund sites. How cool is that? As principal of ComGenesis, Kit provides consulting and training to her clients on a variety of topics, including localization, content strategy, content management, and she speaks at conferences worldwide. She publishes regularly in industry magazines. Her blog is pangeapapers.com. It's been my fortune to get to know Kit over the last couple of years, and we are grateful she agreed to be our visiting TC Dojo master today. Now, Kit says she'll take questions as we go, so type them in when you think of them so you don't forget what you wanted to ask. If you want to ask your question directly to Kit, just put that in there, and I'll unmute you when she reaches the next natural break. Kit, I will pass control to you. Show your screen, and it's all yours. Okay. Hang on one second while I make sure that I'm sharing the right monitor. So everybody should be seeing my... Looks great. My title slide. Great. Thank you everyone for coming to today. I, this is a topic I'm passionate about and I love talking about culture and multicultural communication and working with people around the world. Um, today, so we're going to do some introductions. Um, actually, Liz already introduced me, so I'll just flash up my slides so you can, so you can see the, um, my Twitter feed. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit before we dive into the nitty gritty of <clears throat> Sorry, before we dive into the nitty gritty of actually editing non-native speakers, it's important to understand a couple of things that may be going on with the people you're working with and how to work with them more effectively. So we're going to talk a little bit about that first. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end, but also if you have questions during the, during the session, um, feel free to ask them. And actually, the next... It, it, coming up here in a minute, I'm going to ask you a few questions to start us off. So um, as Liz mentioned, my blog is pangeapapers.com. I've been bad about contributing articles to it lately. Um, I'm working on that. Uh, and Twitter is at KitComGenesis. So feel free to tweet about anything um, during the session that you want to, um, or connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter afterwards. Um, you can also email me uh, and I'll have my email address at the end if you have questions that you think of later or problems that come up later. I'm pretty open. Um, so as we get started, I want you to think about what are your multi multicultural experiences? What multicultural experiences have you had? Do you work with people from other cultures? Have you traveled to other countries? Um, do you speak a second language? And if you do, how fluent are you? And then what are some of your biggest challenges when you work on a multicultural team? So kind of think about that for a second and then um, type your responses into the thing. And I'll wait for a minute so that you can, that you have time to remember what those questions are. So your multicultural experiences, what language, you know, do you speak a second language and how fluent are you? Um, what is your biggest challenge when working multiculturally? You can just put that right in the chat window or the question window in the GoToMeeting webinar panel, and uh, we'll see what you've got, to, what our teams look like. Neat. Jeopardy meet. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Eight years in West Africa, speak Basa or did. Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. I speak five languages, and yet it's difficult to work with local cultural references, many of which just won't plain just plain won't translate. Also, cool mm -hmm. observation. Yep. 
So for those of you who have lived multiculturally, the, the next section will be a little bit of a review for you probably. But um, feel free to chime in with some of your, you know, if you have things that you want to add, um, feel free to chime in on that. Um, do we have any more, Liz? Or Many quiet? years of multicultural experience, including being the only native speaker of English on the team, speak three languages. Wow, that's cool. Wow, so we have an experienced group here today. That's great. Um, <clears throat> Our last so, one says, mo mostly project management in several countries, recently editing academic docs. And we'll send it back to you now, Kit. OK, great. All right, so as I said, this next section might be a little bit of review for those of you who've worked multiculturally, but we have a variety of people on the phone, um, some of whom ha are just starting out working multiculturally. So if you have things to add, if you have a lot of experience, please feel free to type them in the chat and Liz will call them out to me. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of thinking about culture. What is culture? I like um, culture kind of dictates how we view the world, right? And it, and it imbues every aspect of our life with a certain way of thinking, behaving, or working. But one of the things we forget is that culture is not just ethnicity. It's not just what country you live in or were born into. It's not just the language that you speak. It's also um, the organizations that you work for. It's also the political party that you belong to. It's also the fa fa your family of origin. So there are a lot of different layers to culture. And so it, it's important when we're thinking about culture that when we're looking at categories of people, which is basically what culture is, is, is identifying a category of people. They're German, or they're Japanese, or they're um, you know, they're, they're Bantu or whatever, whatever their ethnic culture might be, it's a way of categorizing people. But then when we start working with people as individuals, we have to remember that that, that category only goes so far because people are, every individual is different. Um, in your profession, may, you know, a Japanese engineer and a German engineer may have more in common than a German artist and a German engineer, for example. Um, <clears throat> so in certain contexts. So, so it's important to think about this as, as a multi-layered thing. It's also an iceberg. And those of you who've worked um, multiculturally know this intuitively. The things that get us in trouble are not the things that are obvious that we can walk down the street and immediately say, that person is another ethnicity or, an, uh, or from another country or speaks another language or whatever, um, those things are obvious and we can work around them. Where we start getting in trouble are the things that are barely at our conscious level of awareness, things like what is an appropriate way to introduce yourself in a business situation, um, what table manners are expected, of you in certain countries. Um, you know, things like that that you're aware of as cultural um, mores or societal mores, but not at, but it's only at a partially conscious level and it's only when you're confronted with that difference that you realize. But the things that really get us into trouble are the assumptions that we make about the way the world works that we're completely unaware of um, until we're confronted with something that makes us uncomfortable. And one of the things when we're working with people who are from other cultures, especially cultures that are very different from our own, that we have to keep in mind is that there is no one right way to do something. And if we're, something is making us uncomfortable, we have to be able to step outside ourselves and say, why is this making, and do some analysis. Why is this making me uncomfortable? What is, what is it that there, is it because, could it be that their cultural expectations and my cultural expectations are different? For example, um, 
personal space is not something that we're consciously aware of typically when we're when we're operating within our own culture. But you know, when Americans go to Asia, that gets that cultural expectation gets confronted very quickly, right? Because in Asia, um, the the idea of personal space is much different, and it and it can be very uncomfortable for people. And so, rec just recognizing those things can, goes a long way. But but there's a lot of other aspects of worldview that um, that we are completely unconscious of because it's just been part of who we who we are. We've been conditioned to think this way, and we need to think we need to be able to pull back and think differently when we're working multiculturally. Um, <clears throat> those of you who have worked multiculturally probably will recognize Hofstede's dimensions of culture. Now there has been work, you know, later work that has built on Hofstede's um, dimensions, but they're still pretty valid. Different cultures have different, different things related to power distance, individualism, feminine, masculine uncertainty, all of, the, all of these things come into play in their attitudes and, ha and behaviors in the workplace. And we need to recognize that, you know, your, that someone's idea of time, someone's idea of whether it's appropriate to question you as the editor or whether it's appropriate to question you as the boss, um, we have to create a space and a, we have to create our own team culture when we're working multiculturally and make sure that we are being clear about what people, um, what the expectations are because some cultures need more explicit or, or tend to be more explicit than others. Um, Western European culture tends to be very explicit. Asian culture, um, Latin American culture tends to be more implicit where the rules are just understood by the group by the collective. Um, it, it can be very challenging to, as a Westerner to go into those cultures and be successful because the rules aren't obvious. And so in a team where, the, where people are coming from different cultures, it's really important that you're being explicit about what you're, what you're talking about um, and, and making sure that people feel comfortable asking questions and even challenging you if they disagree with you about something. Um, so a couple of best practices that I found work really well um, are include rising, like I was saying, rising above your own cultural expectations, keeping a beginner mind. There, again, there's more than one right way to do something. There are many paths to get to the right to the right answer, and so practice. Consciously looking at something from a different perspective. Um, play games that force you, you know, if you play video games or um, board games, play games that force you to take a different perspective on the world from what you're comfortable with. Um, if you tend to be a very logical person, try to think about, try to, try not to think, try to feel something. Um, if you are, um, come from a culture that, that has expectations about um, hierarchy, maybe maybe practice um, working in ways that make you a little bit less comfortable. Keeping a beginner's mind, asking questions, that's really key. Any, any comments so far? Uh, we had one more sharing a story. They've been living in Italy six years, somewhat fluent in Italian, but edits documents written by Italians. So that's an interesting combination there. Okay. Um, one of the things that we need that we need to be as editors make sure that we are um, not assuming, right? So we need to check our assumptions, assume good good intentions. When you have more multicultural experience, it's your job to reach further across the table to help pull people um, into the, you know, assimilate them into the multicultural experience, help them, help them grow into that experience, be willing to compromise, um, and be willing to think about things differently and ask questions. Asking questions is really the, 
a huge part of working multiculturally and being willing to learn from the other people around you, even people who are lower or higher on the hierarchy. Um, as an editor, this, this is really important that you're very clear about your expectations. I like to give job aids to people, especially people who are non-native speakers, um, and guidelines. And I, I usually try to work with the team to develop the guidelines as a team um, and make sure that everybody gets heard. Make sure that you're being proactive about communication, especially if you're working virtually, because no news is not good news in a virtual environment. And problems can get exacerbated very, very quickly if you don't um, close that loop. So if you haven't heard from somebody in a few days, you know, make sure you get in touch with them and find out. And if email's not working, get on the phone. Um, I know that a lot of times people who are speaking English as a second or third language don't don't feel as comfortable on the phone as they do via email. But it's really important to um, to make sure that you're connecting with people. Um, and I always follow up, especially on multicultural teams, I always follow up with an email, follow a verbal conversation up with an email to make sure that the understanding is there. Documenting processes and decisions is also important. And giving people a little extra time. Um, I tend to talk very quickly, and I also tend to be an extrovert. So, well, not tend to be, I am an extrovert, let's, let's be real. Um, and so I tend to be very talkative in, in meetings and on the phone, and one of the things that I have to do is count to 20 or 30, and it's really hard for me to be silent for that long, you know, for 30 seconds when I'm, when I'm kind of facilitating a meeting. But I think it's really important, especially when you're um, working multiculturally and multilingually, um, to give people who are not native English speakers time to think through what they want to say in in that kind of environment. So when you're you know when you're working verbally, it's also important when you're editing um, written work to maybe give a little extra time to um, incorporate your comment or to make the changes that you're requesting because even if someone's highly fluent you're still asking them to bend their brain in a different way than, than what their native language does. Okay. Um, again, setting the tone. And again, this is for those of you who already work multiculturally, this is, this is just good reminders, right? Um, being comfortable with ambiguity, modeling best practices, making sure that you're being flexible, um, and yet you know, getting the job done, right? And communicating. It, there's no such thing as too much communication, especially in a multicultural team. Um, one of the things that happens a lot with language is that some cultures have a higher level of formality than English, that or than, than American English. Um, and so when they're writing, they write with a very high level of formality, when, even when they're writing in English, and that can come across as being stilted and stiff. So part of what you have as an editor, what you need to do is be able to not only adjust your style when you're working with that person, um, but also help them adjust their style when they're writing in English. To um, and, and it's important to know whether you're writing in American, American English, British English, Indian English, Australian English. Um, and adjust appropriately what your editing is because those dialects are different a little bit. Um, British English is more passive. Um, some of the terminology is different. Uh, some of the expectations are different. So um, it's important to make sure that you're adjusting your style um, to be appropriate for the style of English that you're editing as well. And always put the people and the relationships first. Um, that's particularly important if you're working with Asia or Latin America or Africa. Um, relationships, you, you can't get work done without having good relationships with people. And it's true even in the West, um, less so perhaps, but um, it's still true in the West. People, if people don't like you, they're not going to do their best work for you. Um, 
if they don't respect you, they're not going to do their best work for you. So make sure that you are working as a team and making everyone feel included in that team. I, this is one of my favorite quotes about editing. Um, editing, people tend to get very sensitive about their writing. And especially if they're not, if writing is not their primary job, and they're not used to being edited, uh, they can get very sensitive about it. So your job is to help their voice come through more clearly, right? It is not your job to butcher what they're doing. Um, you know, having said that, though, if you're if you're working with non-native English speakers, you're going to find some some common mistakes that are really based on what what their language of origin is. There's an awesome book called uh, Learner's English, and it was written for ESL teachers primarily. Um, but it goes through the different language families and explains why, the in detail, a lot more detail than we can cover today, why um, this might be, uh, you know, why these mistakes might happen. So we're going to start getting into some of the nitty gritty about why this is. So organization and logic, um, different cultures think, you know, language dictates how you think. And in the West, we are very uh, deductive, you know, we go from general to specific. But not every culture and not every language encourages that. In, in Japan, for example, um, it tends to be more inductive, right? They, it tends to go, they tend to talk around things and not go directly to um, what they want you to do. Um, and they find that when things are worded in, in West, you know, the Western way can be a little bit harsh and can feel harsh and, and too, um, you know, too straightforward for them. So when you're working with people, what you'll find when people write in their second or third language is that they tend to follow the organization and logic that is dictated by their mother tongue. Okay? So what you will find is that it might take, um, you know, the ger you know, if it's a German guy, he he'll be very cut and dried. You know, it'll be first this, then this, then this, then this, then this. But if it's somebody from Japan or China, they may take a while to actually get to the point of whatever it is that they're talking about because that's the that's the lang that that's what their mother tongue dictates, right? So it's really important to think about that. Does anybody who's working um, with other languages on a regular basis, do you have some, does anybody have an example of where this might be true? Take a couple of minutes, type in your answer. Um, Kid, if you want to step on while they type, I will interrupt you as soon as I have answers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here are some examples. Uh, from English.com. And to a native English speaker, these sound very funny because they're not they're not direct enough to know really what what is the message meant to be. Um, and and they're they're talking around the problem instead of coming straight to the point, right? Uh, so it can be hard for a native English speaker to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, and one of the one of the reasons is that the the deductive style of writing tends to be reader focused like helping the reader understand what's going on whereas the the you know the inductive style of writing tends to be more writer focused and and it's about what the what the it's up to the reader to figure out what the writer means okay and it's a different perspective it's not wrong it's just different but it, when it's something is translated into English, it can cause confusion. Okay, so a couple of things that you need to know is when, it, and this is especially problematic with marketing writing. Um, the one, this one right here, this is actually marketing. They're intending this to be a marketing writing piece. You know, they're wanting you to be happy about using it, and they're trying to trying to 
make it so that it sounds like a good product, right? So making sure that you know the audience and purpose and adjust accordingly. Um, a lot of times what I have authors fill out as a brief about what they're trying to accomplish with their writing. So who is their audience? What is the purpose of the content? Is it marketing writing? Is it instructional? Is it, uh, because you're going to make, is it fiction? You know, because you're going to make changes, different types of changes based on that, um, based on what that purpose is, right? Um, making sure that the, that the warnings and cautions come first before any instructional things. Um, sometimes you have, there have been times where I've had to take a paragraph that was written by someone from another language and had to actually cut the sentences out and rearrange them, you know, physically rearrange them so that I could see what they were trying to say in, in a lot in a more logical or logical to me organization. Um, arranging things from general to specific or um, by time or adding subheads, bullets, or numbers to clarify relationships, sometimes you end up having to rewrite it. Um, that is not ideal because really your job as an editor is to help maintain the, the author's voice while at the same time, um, you know, helping, their, helping them be clear about what they're trying to say. We have and, one story from the audience, and it echoes what you've been saying, that it really depends on the reader, user, and their culture. Right. Right. So another, another one, misplaced words that are, are very, very common. Um, and I loved this tweet that Matthew Anderson did a few years ago, or a uh, few years ago, a few months ago, um, that the adjectives in English absolutely are in this order, and you don't even think about this. As a native speaker, you just don't think about it, right? Because that's just the way it is. But long noun phrases really screw people up in other cultures because some cultures only allow for a certain, or some languages only allow for a certain number of words, descriptive words associated with a noun. Um, other ones don't have a, a strong possessive like, like English does. So it makes it more, you know, when you, like for example in Spanish, you would say, um, you know, you could say el carro, el auto rojo, um, but you wouldn't say my father's red car, you would say el auto rojo de mi papa. Okay, so it's the red car of my father, right? The car, to, or to transliterate, the car red of my, of my father. So when you have lots, of, and a lot of languages put the noun first and then the adjective, but English, the English and Germanic languages put the adjective first and then the noun. So when you have a long noun string, you end up with people not knowing where the emphasis, what's the most important word in that string. And you get interesting, interesting, um, and this is just, I, I just put this up as, as some examples of syntax. Now, obviously, English doesn't always follow the subject verb object. Um, <clears throat> but if you're using active voice, that's what we do, right? This is just the typical. This is not like every, I'm sure there are exceptions in every every example, right? Um, the other thing is we don't have in English that a lot of other languages do are gendered nouns. So <clears throat> boat is boat. You know, it's not masculine or feminine or anything. It's just neutral. But if um, or cat, like say cat is a neutral is a neutral noun in English, but in Spanish it's gato, and that's a masculine form, el gato. Okay, so you know in other languages you and I'm using Spanish because that's the language I'm second language I'm most familiar with, even though I'm not fluent. Um, 
but but the same is true in other languages where you have where it depends on um, the noun can often dictate how the not only the verb the form of the verb but also the order of the sentence right so so what's being talked about can can dictate um, endings in Polish there are seven cases and so it's not just numbers um, or it's not just gender but it's also the number of things being talked about um, the um, the case of you know you know the context in the sentence of where it's being talked about whether it's the object or the subject of the sentence or whether it's being used as a noun or an adjective so it's really important that I mean this is just like a the base you can dive deep into the linguistics and um, it, it becomes a rabbit hole after a while but um, but this is just to give you an example of how how the syntax can be so different in each language and it explains why you get things like I came already there which in English you know what it means right but the already should be um, either between the I and the came or already should be at the end of the sentence. It's depending on the context. Where is book? You know, missing articles. Slavic languages don't have, and many other languages don't have articles. So they don't, they don't tend to use them in their English. Um, <clears throat> for languages where it's not subject verb object they can forget that they need to put um, the object after the verb in English right um, some languages don't have to be verbs so they if you don't have a to be verb it's easy to forget to use it right um, when when you're doing negatives depending on where that goes in the sentence. So it depends, it really depends a lot on the, the language that you're working with, what types of mistakes you're going to see most often with word order. Um, but these are some of the common ones. Um, so, you know, the easiest thing is just to fix it, but then explain why you, why you made that change. Um, at least the first time. So one of the things that you have to be careful about when editing non-native speakers is you could probably be correcting every sentence, but if you tell, if you explain the same mistake multiple times, then it becomes really hard for them to, they get overwhelmed. So <clears throat> when you explain why you made a change, um, just do it the first time. Right? And then that helps them. And then if there's a way, you know, look at if you can make a job aid for them for the next time that they're working through. Make sure that you're using correct grammar and terminology, grammar terminology as well. Because people who study a language formally have learned the verb and noun declensions, have learned the genitive nominative case and stuff like that. So make sure you know those correct terms for the English, um, the infinitives, the gerunds and all of that stuff. Make sure you're using the terminology correctly. Any any questions before I go on? I have two other comments. I think that were related to your uh, your slide about how do you could rearrange it in order to to make it make sense to you and then work backwards. Uh, they were both real time solution and real time saver. Mm-hmm. And I have a question for later, but I'm going to hold it because they asked me to. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. So word choice. So one of the challenges in English is that it doesn't just borrow from other languages. It follows other languages down dark alleys, knocks them over the head, and rifles through the pockets for loose grammar. English, <clears throat> sorry, English is a, is a Germanic language. 70% of the vocabulary is from the French. And there's a bunch of words from a bunch of different languages thrown in there just kind of randomly. And we just kind of co-opt them. And this is, this is especially true when you start looking at um, 
regional Englishes like Indian English or Australian English or British English or American English. And sometimes the words being used don't mean the same things even in English. So <clears throat> that can be very challenging for people to know what words to choose. Then when you think about how much, how many words there are in English versus other languages, um, it, it can be mind-blowing because there, there are words in English that have very nuanced meanings. We have a lot of synonyms for, for different things, but they have nuanced meanings depending on context. In, in French and Spanish and Chinese, for example, we have they have a lot fewer land, words, and so to choose from, and so they tend they tend to have broader meaning. <clears throat> and um, so that that's also why you end up with a lot of text expansion because it can be hard if you don't have an exact word that means the same thing. You have to use a whole sentence or a paragraph to explain the concept, right? So. Um, so word choice becomes a very interesting issue, uh, even for very, very fluent people. Um, my in-laws have been in this country for since the 1960s. Uh, they speak four languages fluently. Their native language is Dutch, and they still mix up words sometimes. And my husband, who is a first-generation um, native English speaker, mixes them up in the same way. So you can get generational uh, word choice errors um, based on based on that. So when people are first le learning a language, they use the wrong ver verb tense a lot because the first verb tense that you learn is typically present tense. So for example, in Spanish, I, I really struggle with past tense. So I will say things like, yo voy a la playa una semana pasada, which means I go to the beach a week ago. It still gets my point across, but it's not right. And I know it's not right, but I don't, I, I struggle with the past tense of the verbs because I didn't learn those. Again, if you're missing to be verbs, um, missing to be verbs are very common if for language learners who come from, from languages whose native language doesn't have a to be verb. Um, the which, that, and who, even native English speakers mix this up and screw this up. People are whose, not that. Okay. Um, but for a non-native speaker, this is a really confusing common thing. Uh, synonyms used in the wrong context. Borrow, lend. In Scandinavian languages, borrow and lend is the same word, is essentially the same word, and it's only by context that you knew which one, which way it's meant. So when I was living in North Dakota, I was working with people, they were native English speakers, but they would say, can you borrow me this, when they meant, could you lend me this? And so again, that's a generational error in word choice because their, their parents' native language or their grandparents' native language didn't, didn't have the same thing. And that's how English and other languages change over time, right? Um, Subject-verb agreement, again, is a common problem even in, with native speakers. Pluralizing collective nouns, um, very common. False friends are especially dangerous uh, because they look almost the same and sound almost the same, but become, in English, means something different, completely different from becoming in Dutch, which means to get or acquire. Um, um, come and common in German means something completely different. Missing articles, again, it, the Slavic languages particularly uh, will have this error because it's, the articles don't exist in their language. So when you're, when you're studying other languages, it helps if you know a little bit about the languages that the people are coming from um, because then it makes it easier to edit because you can go, kind of go through and identify. Um, issues. One of our attendees also says that Spanish come and go is one of those. Yep. 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 That's that's also true. <clears throat> um, so adjust the word choice so that it works in English. Um, obviously, most of the time when I'm editing non-native speakers, 
unless the sentence is really confusing and I can't figure out what they mean by it, I just fix it, right? I just fix it and then I go through and explain you know, if they want, you know, the, the other thing that you need to think about with non-native speakers is they may not want you to tell them what they did wrong. They may, they may, you, so this is part of the conversation you need to have up front. Do you want coaching on how to fix these problems or do you want me to just fix them? So that's, a, that's one thing that you need to make sure because some people know that their English isn't great and they just want you to fix it and they aren't that interested in, um, in doing it differently because that's what they're comfortable with. Other people want to get better at English and so they want you to explain to them why you made changes. Um, and they may ask you very pointed questions and very detailed questions, so making sure that you're using the correct terminology when you're explaining it and being able to justify your changes is really important, okay? Um, and document it. Um, even if you're, you know, you don't want to, sometimes I print it, print it out. I mean, I, you know, I know most of us do editing online anymore, but when it's something that a non-native English speaker has written, I will sometimes pre-edit it in a printed version because sometimes it's easier to go back and forth to see exactly, you know, I'll read through the whole thing um, before I really make any major changes to it to make sure that I'm understanding what they're what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so that also helps you with the word choices and the and what works. One of the other things that I do is if you're you know if you're working in a company is making sure that they have access to the glossary that and preferably the multilingual glossary that kind of identifies the preferred term in English for all and the preferred term in the other languages so that if their native language, for example, is German, they can see the multilingual dic in the multilingual glossary that this German word should be translated when they're writing in English to this English word. Um, that can be very helpful to people. Um, so, you know, making sure that you are using, you know, that you're giving them tools and job aids that are going to help them, um, maybe giving them a checklist. Um, can also help if you're finding common problems. Sometimes running a little workshop or a little brown bag can help. Punctuation is an interesting one because um, a lot of languages don't actually use a lot of punctuation, and so it can be really confusing for people. And, and in addition to punctuation, I would say formatting can be a problem. Um, with Asian languages particularly, uh, the ideographic languages don't typically use bold because when you do, and it's a small font, um, a small type size, uh, the bold kind of causes the strokes to blur and it makes it harder to read. So what they tend to do is put quotes around things that are bold and where we would just bold it, for example. Um, apostrophes are used differently in Dutch, an apostrophe S is a plural and not a possessive. And so while the Dutch, most of the time you don't have to edit people, you know, they're writing very much, that is one area where they tend to, tend to um, have issues because the word, the, the plural versus possessive is, is done differently. Um, comma placement can be different because they, they, when they read, they tend to read in the cadence of their native language. And so if their native language has comma, commas after um, certain, in certain places that English doesn't have them, they'll tend to put them there. Another problem that you run into is hyphenation or compound, compound adjectives. Um, German, uh, Dutch, some of the other ones create compound words based on um, based on what the noun is and what the adjectives are. And so um, you can sometimes get people forgetting to put spaces between the words um, or hy over hyphenating. 
like three alarms should be hyphenated but not fire in this case. Another problem that you have is if nouns are, with Germans, is that a lot of times in English, they'll capitalize the nouns even though, even though they shouldn't be capitalized in English because in German, nouns are capitalized. Conversely, in other languages, you don't capitalize like days of the week and things like that, and so they may forget. So um, those are just some examples from different languages. Um, I usually just fix the punctuation. Most of the time I don't even bother explaining it um, unless they have told me that they want to learn that because punctuation, for some, getting the correct punctuation is very, it's like a higher degree of fluency than most people, I, I don't know, for some reason the punctuation tends to be the hardest thing for people to get right. Um, so. And, and that's true of native English speakers too. So I usually just fix it. Um, I usually, if if they have long sentences, I usually just break it up into multiple sentences, making sure that you know. Sometimes I can I give them a job aid or a cheat sheet if they ask for it. Um, but again, it, it's really as an editor, especially if you're working virtually, you need to make sure that you're in communication with the author and making sure that you're giving them the feedback in a way that. Um, isn't overwhelming to them, but will actually help them do better um, going forward. Are there any questions so far? Um, we have one for the end, but here we are. All right, let me ask you a question. You can answer, and then we're going to shift back, and I'll tell you all what's coming up next. Uh, so you, this is your chance to write in your questions. Um, I know that I don't speak German, but I find myself wanting to capitalize nouns, too. Um, here's our question. When editing, translating, do you do or would you use simplified technical English as your target style? Why or why not? Um, as with so many things in technical communication, uh, it depends. Um, simplified technical English to do it right requires a little bit more than just deciding that you're going to do it. It requires um, a pretty rigid style guide and controlled vocabulary and um, training of, of the people on your team. Um, I, think, I think having a glossary, at a minimum, having a glossary, having um, job aids, and writing things as simply as, as you can are all good practices. Whether you're following the spec to the T um, really depends on your company and and the audience and so on. Um, so yeah, it can be it, it can be very helpful, um, but it, in some cases it might be overkill. All right. Well, now it's time to type in your questions. Let me show you what's coming up. Thank you, Kit. That was great. All right, coming up. Uh, very soon, we're having our first, our next TC Dojo Mastermind session. Uh, the Mas TC Dojo Mastermind group is a monthly di driven discussion group where attendees present, present specific technical communication challenges and topics on their mind in a confidential, supportive environment. Uh, mastermind groups have been cited in Forbes as being extremely valuable to the attendees. We have two going on right now. One is everything techcom, so data, topic-based authoring, specifics of cross-references, graphics, do you do inline linking? Um, the other is product-focused, it's Arbor Text and Windchill. Overall, these are collaborative peer-to-peer -peer environments where everyone can lend their experience to each other. It's been kind of amazing to participate in and a lot of fun too. Um, these are not free as a way to guarantee dedication and commitment to all the parties involved. Um, you can sign up at mastermindtcdojo.org today. Um, our topic this month is how to decide when to do an upgrade and how you make that decision. Always a questionable one. And our next TC Dojo next month, end of the year, let's do something fun. We're going to talk about death proofing your documentation. Um, what happens when your customer dies? What happened, what's documented, what isn't, what's the policy? Uh, as technical communicators, we are uh, uniquely positioned to handle these issues. Um, and if you're an independent or you run a small company, what happens if you die? Who tells your customers you're not finishing that project? Who knows who all of your customers are? Who knows where your servers are and, and the rest of those kinds of things? 
um, are we documenting not just our processes but everything we do so that our coworkers can take over. Um, it's an interesting uh, topic and we'll talk about this kind of an interesting way to end the year, talking about the end of life, uh, but it, uh, it, it'll be fun, I think. So that's next month in December. How do you find out what's coming up? Go to tcdojo.org and it's at the bottom of the page. You'll see exactly what's coming up for the next six months. I think we have through March or February already booked. All right, let's see if we have some questions. We answered the technical English question. Um, here's one. How do I establish rapport with someone if they're somewhere far away so that I can work with them on their writing? So the first thing I would do, especially since English is probably not their first language, is get on Skype or um, go to meeting with your webcam turned on. So that means you can't be in your jammies. Um, <laughs> And and just talk to them a little bit about who, you know, get to know them a little bit about and find out what they're, you know, trying to, I, I usually have um, a checklist that I send them about what kinds of things they want, um, they want to do ahead of time. I always provide an agenda when I'm doing a meeting. Um, and when when I'm doing something where I have where I'm working with people in multiple time zones who may not know each other in person, I always allow a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting for people to do a check-in. I find out where everybody's at, what's going on in their world, um, allowing a few minutes of of casual chit chat before you actually get started with the meeting can really help with the with the rapport building. Um, the other thing is an email, not diving right into whatever the issue is at hand, but asking how someone's doing or making a comment about what's going on in your world um, can, can really build that rapport. It doesn't really take that much because people are, most people are used to working virtually now, but, but especially when you're working with Asian cultures, it's the the relationship building is really important and um, should not be skipped over. That sounds like a key for helping um, smooth over feedback or at least give and receive feedback. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm giving feedback verbal, I, I usually try to sit down with an author um, when I'm editing their work the first, especially the first time because Seeing all of the edits on the page can be a little overwhelming, so I tend to sit down with them. And if you're not in the same office, I would get on a webcam. And make sure the webcam's on because 70% of your communication is nonverbal. So even if, I'm flu even, if, even if I was fluent in Spanish, I would prefer being able to see someone speaking if I had to speak in Spanish. So give them that courtesy. They're already reaching pretty far across the across the table by speaking your language. So do them the courtesy of letting them see you when they're talking to you. That, um, and that's probably not just across cultures, but anybody who's tr getting feedback on their work that can be immensely helpful, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's it's hard to, um, those nonverbals uh, are so important in, in reducing miscommunication. You know, we all know about the email flame wars that have started because somebody <laughs> misinterpreted something that somebody said and took it a lot more harshly than it was intended, right? Absolutely. Oh, here's a good one. Our audience often requests context for sections of documentation. Why would I do something and when? It has been difficult to get some members of our writing group to provide context despite repeated training session encouragement edits, etc. Do you think there could be a cultural component here too? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, I, my guess is that they probably come from a culture where the rules are implicit rather than e explicit. And so um, the assumption is that, that people understand the context, right? Whereas with um, English documentations, particularly American English, we tend to be very ex 
explicit about the context in which somebody is doing expected to do a particular activity. So, um, you know that that I think is maybe looking at what is their native language and how do they express things, and maybe ask some questions of them about how do they tell somebody, you know, when they're when when they need to do a particular activity, how do they know that that's the that's when they're supposed to do it as a user? Um, how does what are the contextual clues? Because they may think that they're providing context, even if they're not. So you can also provide a checklist, maybe, um, and ask them to fill that out, like the who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, you know, maybe give them a little more context for the question. Why is it important? They may not be understanding why it's important. Excellent. All right, we have one last question. I find it interesting you uh, suggested to play board games. I would love for you to give some examples, maybe on the blog, because I know you're going to have to think a little, um, that apply to different languages, cultural situations, a kind of matchup for explorers, so to speak. Can you say that again? So you, you talked about playing board games, right, to give yeah. you a way to get out of your comfort zone. It'd be interesting if you could do sort of a maybe a blog post later, because I know you're going to have to think about it, um, a nice sort of matchup between if you're trying to explore this culture or this language or this situation, try this board game. Oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, I just, I just funded a Kickstarter that's talking about um, it's a language Kickstarter, the language game Kickstarter. Cool. All right. And I'll have, I'll yeah. see if I can, I'll see if I can find the link and I'll send it to you, Liz, and then you can send it out to everybody. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, uh, one of the games that I, that I was thinking of that's a, it's available on, off of, it's called Dark Dimensions, and it's a three-dimensional cube. It's a matching game. It's a very easy matching game, except that it's time, you know, it's a timed matching game, which makes it hard. But in order to win the game, you have to rotate the cube because the view of the cube is different, or, or the view of the playing field is different based on where you rotate the cube. So things like that really help you stay, say, okay, well, I need to change my perspective. Nice. Right? Um, so I'll, I'll try and think of some other ones like that. I'll, I'll enlist the help of my stepson, who's a big board game geek. Excellent. That sounds great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Kip, for another awesome session. Uh, we've got a lot of thank you both. Thank you. That was great comments in the um, in the in the question window and in the chat window and I will send you uh, thank you thank you so much thanks everybody for coming and we'll hopefully see you next month we'll have a little bit of fun thanks if you have any questions feel free to email me later all right thanks everybody bye